Hey everyone, and we're back with the Latin America Space Challenge evening session. My name is Victor, and I'm part of Latin America uh, team, organization team. And uh, for this pitch deck presentation, we have Beyond Rocket design team. They are team ID 16. They are going to talk about the responsive launch capability of small sats. They are from University Federal of Itajuba. And uh, the first presenter is Maria. Maria, are you ready? Yes, I am. Right now? All right. Um, good afternoon. My name is Maria. And together with my colleagues, Rodrigo, Luis, and Lucas, we will introduce our company, Beyond Corporation. Uh, small sets like CubeSats are increasingly present in different sectors, such as biome monitoring, telecommunications, and AED and digital plantations. However, we note that there is an unmet demand for orbital rocket launches from Latin America, which could reduce logistics costs and costs related uh, to the launch itself as we will discuss further ahead. In addition, with the advent of companies in the aerospace sector in the country, there is also the development of new technologies and more investments in the area, making Brazil more competitive in this industry. You can reach and learn more about us on our site, and we'll talk more about, about it later. Uh, so, the Alcantara Launch Center is located in the city of Alcantara, in Marion, where it has a low population density. This center is located in a geographically favorable region as it's closer to the equator line, about 2 degrees 19 south, which implies a greater rotation speed in this area, which serves to give the rocket an extra boost. This boost helps save up to 30% on fuel, which makes the launch more viable and economical. Besides, the climate is quite stable at all times of the year, but the best months are June and July, due to low precipitation, and low values of wind speeds at low local altitude. In addition, the rainy seasons are well defined through, throughout the year. The these factors are known to be very important in the time, at the time of the launch. In 2020, the launch center tried to carry out tests with training rockets without loads. An example was carried out in June this year in order to show that everything is working and that the center is prepared to, for larger missions as mentioned by the director of the ALC. It's highly complicated to assume that a rocket can be made from just one material. A project uh, that requires the transport of half load to orbit needs light and resistant materials, which withstand high temperatures when entering the orbit and which it fits within a displayed budget. The materials were chosen based on key properties such as high working temperature, price, ease of manufacture, and density. So, the proportion suggested for the elaboration of the rocket body and its respective fixation and support part is impossible to be calculated without a true, thorough study of the rocket design. Thus, aluminum, carbon fiber, and steel were the materials chosen for the constru construction of the space vehicle with titanium being the material coated for the combustion chamber, as well as the small parts along the span of the rocket. Uh, now I will talk about the economic viability and how we plan to establish ourselves in the market, starting with a con contextualization of this sector. Currently, the aerospace industry as a whole move around $360 billion annually, and it is expected that this value will jump to more than $1 trillion by 2040. And specifically, in the field of satellite launching, the aerospace market moves around $5 billion. Now, talking about Brazil. The Brazilian Space Agency is currently available for launching non-military space vehicles from the Alcântara Launch Center, and the resources generated with the launches on this base will be invested in the Brazilian space program. Continuing our economic analysis, we will introduce our business model. Our main customers uh, are science and technology institutes, mainly from Brazil and other Latin America countries, and satellite manufacturers, such as Visiona Space Technology and Acosta Aerospace. 
the way we hope to benefit the customer is not only to launch the satellites to the calculated orbits, but also to facilitate the provision of the service for him. Uh, here we present the ways in which we can present our solutions to customers and keep in touch. One intention is for negotiation to launch to keep the customer as close to us and to the production chain as possible. Complementing what I was saying, our main value with the customer is the trust, transparency of our process and decisions regarding the service contracted by him. Finally, our sources of revenue are firstly, the services we provide, which is the launch vehicle project and the planning and, and execution of missions for low earth orbit, private investments, such as those of the companies presented, which are focused on high risk investments in the aerospace sector, and government inv investments, for example, from the BNDES. Um, okay, so our schedule is divided into two stages. The first one begins with an economic viability research, followed by a primary design of the vehicle in association um, with some material testing. That will allow us uh, that we will allow the product cost to be estimated and then settled with our providers. Having this information is key to negotiating with our potential customers and moving on, on uh, with the project. Then we get to the second phase in which the development of the vehicle uh, and mission will occur based on the customer's needs. Uh, the primary design is going to be improved and all the parts required to create a prototype will be manufactured. As soon as the prototype is completely assembled, a series of tests will take place and all the data collected from these tests are going to be analyzed and used to make eventual corrections on the project. Meanwhile, the rocket parts will begin to be manufactured and the assembly process will start. And then some final tests and adjustments are going to be made along the whole vehicle. And Finally, uh, the payload will be integrated to the fair instructor, uh, giving us a 10 days uh, launch window for the mission. Uh, the Alcantara Launch Center has an air base with a paved and signaled airstrip and an aircraft yard, uh, which makes the transport of cargo and materials uh, easier and faster. Uh, besides, the region has a low population density which makes it easier to expand the area of operation of the launch center, what couldn't happen in Barreira do Inferno Launch Center, for example. Uh, finally, because the Alcantara Center is closer to, uh, to the ocean, uh, this helps the ship transportation as well as the safety of the impact areas on the sea that multi-stage uh, rockets often need to have. Uh, observing the conditions of our operation, the following potential risks were identified. So few investors, uh, as in, a, in an incident, uh, can result also in the loss of these uh, few investors. Uh, a lack of qualified professionals, because here in Brazil, the colleges are unable to meet this uh, demand of aerospace uh, professionals. And no competitiveness, uh, because on uh, no competitiveness on the rocket uh, recovery until we can develop this technology by our own. In conclusion, we provide our customers the best conditions, best conditions to the rocket launch, uh, being the main ones, good climate and logistics, more economy, and the country is one of the best places in the world for rocket launches. Uh, here you can see our references with just a few of them, and you can all assess our website for more information. Um, now, I'm just going to show a little bit of our um, website, with, with, uh, which we have made. Um, so the, here in the homepage, we can see, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the Portuguese section. So we can see, a little bit of our services, our teams, uh, our location, which is great as, uh, as it was mentioned. And we have some sections of about us and all this, uh, our team and all this stuff. Um, a little bit of our services and some news that we can uh, share with the community. And 
also um, some contact info if you have any questions um, to send to us. So that's our presentation and thank you very much. Well, really nice present presentation from Beyond Rocket Team. I'd like to thank Lucas, Rodrigo, Maria, and Luis. It was a really nice presentation. Uh, I think we have a question from João from the Logic Organization team. Please, João. Yes, uh, my my question is about uh, about uh, the rocket and the development of the the rocket you're planning to to do. Uh, do you plan on developing the technology yourselves or uh, buying from uh, other people like some other teams here presented? So buying the rocket motor from some company or developing the rocket motors yourself? Uh, due to the time we have to to deliver this, this project, I think it would be like better and we would have a better result if we use it like ready made solutions, not try to innovate in this first project and try more to actually, yes, use another solutions that are ready made. So maybe we, yes, we, I think we could buy some solutions, of course, and maybe get some, some basis on the other solutions that are not like patented, you know, maybe what we can, can take, which is free, I think we, we should take, and try not to be too innovative because of the time we have to deliver. Did I answer? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really great. That's really uh, what we are seeing here today uh, in, uh, in other presentations that, and is really the way we think uh, about it. Um, I, I think that's okay for now. Thank you for the team and good luck and we will wait for you later in the award ceremony. Thank you, everyone.
Hey everyone, and we're back with the uh, Latin America time. Space Challenge Pitch Deck presentation. Now we're going to host Supernova Rocket Rocketry. They are Team ID 19, and they are going to talk about the responsive launch capability of small sets. They are already with us, and uh, they prepared a video. So whenever you're ready, John. The comet is heading towards Earth in August 2021 in northeast Brazil, and scientists say it might be composed of an unknown particle that has never been studied before. Getting to know its features would be a great advance for science. The space race should take a small satellite to it has begun. Will you be the great promoter of this research? Guys, are you going to do something about it? Should we join the race? But how? We don't even have a vehicle. Yeah, and the project should be ready within eight months. Can we make it? We can start it now. There is no company in Brazil that could do it. So that means we have a chance. We should take it a shot. I have some ideas for you. The aerospace field is pretty scarce in Brazil, lacking companies that are able to deploy a satellite at high altitudes. Because of their high position above the Earth, satellites are very effective in providing white coverage, and the 22 million square kilometers of the Brazilian monitoring territory is made almost entirely by foreign satellites. In 2019, only 4.7% of all money in the aerospace industry was invested on satellite production and launch. The other part was spent in the industry of service provided by these satellites, like scientific research, security, monitoring, and telecommunications, and peripheral equipment. Alcantara Launch Center is one of the best places to launch rockets in the world. Due to its climate environment, only 70% of rocket fuel that would be used in other centers is needed. It is located next to the ocean and the equator, and since the weather is stable, the vehicle could be launched all year long. First of all, if we're gonna do this, we gotta do it right. That's why we have to fit the product on a business model. Don't worry guys, we'll get into the point as we talk more. So our idea is to develop a vehicle that could meet the company's demand, launching a satellite to monitor the comet in a way that would be profitable for both sides. Since developing a rocket of this magnitude can cost millions of dollars, it's not suitable to build in a for a single event, even if it's a very profitable one. The idea is to develop an on-demand vehicle with the product due to July 21. After the initial test, our first project will be monitoring the comet. Once the cost of implementing is high compared to the financial return at first launch, the vehicle will be reused multiple times with a responsible launch that is time-sensitive. In case the urge of deployment a small set in Latin America, our company can schedule an on-time launch with quickness and efficiency. With that being said, we shall now start our project, which may be called Super Ardo. But how would a rocket of this magnitude work? Uh, it should be capable of going up to approximately 2000k and come back safely. Let's give a technical look on it. The first stage of the engine embodies nine motors that together consist of a class Y propulsion system with around 170k of thrust. The liquid propellants of this mechanism will be a mixture of refined kerosene as fuel and liquid oxygen as an oxidizer in a proportion of 2.5 per 1. There is a regenerative cooling system on this engine that utilizes the propellant to cool the titanium alloy engine. The nozzle is a bell-shaped, and the ignition is based on the hypergloric process of TEA and TEB compounds. For the second stage, we have one motor, basically with the same specs as the other nine, but with a larger nozzle, and it will have around 20k of thrust. The rocket will consist of two stages. In the first one, we have a carbon fiber fuselage with built-in tanks, a carbon fiber skirt with thermal protection shields, and three carbon fiber fins with an aluminum skeleton. Of course, there's the whole engine mount with air brakes on top for recovery purpose and avionics bay and parachutes. For the second stage, there are some similar components like another set of fins, another engine mount, again a carbon fiber fuselage and an avionics bay. 
but in this section there must be a payload adapter made out of a cone-shaped magnesium piece with a top plate made especially for each payload carried by the launcher. And finally, we also have a carbon fiber ferry made out of two pieces, which separates by the use of shared pins, where there are also internal layers of other materials for thermal and acoustic protections, also depending on the payload requirements. Autonomous vehicle consists of a pre-redundant onboard computers, each with sensors such as accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, and GPS receivers. The onboard computer utilizes this data in order to determine its position, velocity, and rotation, as well as the angle of inclination. It connects monitors and controls different parts of the vehicle, such as engines, tanks, separation devices, telemetry and communication, as well as external instruments, such as pilot tubes and barometers. It uses a system on a ship containing an FPGA for processing. The goal is to have a reusable rocket, and for that, the recovery system will work using two parachutes in a dual deployment. The fuselage, made of carbon composite, receives thermal treatment in order to withstand their vehicle's re-entry into the atmosphere. In approximately 7.5 minutes of flight, the drogue is ejected, and one minute later, the second event with the main release happens. The vehicle is recovered in the Atlantic Ocean in a splashdown method, and afterwards is rescued by a vessel. Why would this solution work and why would it be better than, don't know, pick a random American company and launch with them? We are pioneers in this type of business in Latin America, with a highly qualified and totally exclusive team for this project, which is able to supply the need for satellite monitoring in our continent in a quick way. We can also count on partnerships with many satellite startups, which can serve with quality in one of the best launch bases in the world. National raw material is cheap, so rockets that are made in Brazil are cheaper than using a dollar currency, and would also boost the economy of the country. It would be the lowest price on the market without losing its quality. It will also spread science and increase the economy in underdeveloped countries, reducing inequality. The initial investment should focus on the construction of the vehicle as a whole and the labor. In the future, considering recovery and maintenance of the rockets, the price for each launch will be about $8 million, and it's considered that after the fifth launch, the company will start to profit. The rockets will launch satellites of already existing companies in Latin America that usually have to look for foreign agencies to do its job, being very expensive and time-consuming. The project will expand the engineering, science and technology job markets in the country. There are some things to consider that need to be taken care of. Since the vehicle needs to be launched at least five times so the investments can be paid off, recovery mistakes need to be thought of, as well as damage and replacement of components. Also, since it's an expensive investment, partnerships, fundraisers and loans need to be made off in order to finish the project. Although it is believed that when winning the race to monitor the comets, the team will have half of its expenses paid off and more agencies will look for sponsoring us. Furthermore, it is a risk that our team would like to take, considering all the math and the probabilities. With that being said, we are ready to start a new project. Shall we? So right now I'm, I'm waiting to see you with somebody from uh, Lask has any questions? If we... Uh, do you have any questions around here guys? No. No questions? So yeah, thank you again. The team from Beyond, they're here. Uh, I think we have with us here uh, a lot of people. We have Camila, we have... Um, Gustavo and other people from beyond here as well and Juliana I think and 
we would like to thank you again for your presentation. We thought that it was really awesome, a really fun presentation. And thank you for your participation. Thank you. And we're back with the Latin American Space Challenge Pitch Deck presentation. And we're live with Project Jupiter, Team ID 17. They're going to talk about the responsive launch capability of small sets. They're already with us. Guys, are you, are you ready for your presentation? Yes. Yes. OK, so you guys have 10 minutes. Good luck. OK. Good afternoon, I'm Eduarda from Project Jupiter, and today Laura and I are going to be presenting our proposal for the second challenge, Responsive Launch Capability of Small Sets. Our presentation will follow a specific train of thought which consists mainly in the topics shown here. Before we introduce the problem and explain our approach to solve it, we took a few steps to better organize our ideas. Firstly, we wanted to truly understand the problem that was in front of us, getting to know all of its causes, consequences, details, and already implemented solutions. Once this was done, we did some market studies in order to see which was the progression for small sets in the next few years and how was this market in Brazil and Latin America. Then we adopted the Mural software to organize our thoughts in a very logic and visual way. This was when we began our work. We did a business model canvas which gave us the whole picture view and was key to our project development. We then worked on some simulations, not just running but developing them, and did some massive research analysis calculations and came up with our project from scratch. Okay, we explained how we executed our ideas, but you may be wondering, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Why small sets? We know that since the space race, humanity has been using and improving satellite communication, which has different applications, such as natural disaster prevention, monitoring borders, and collecting geographic information. Besides that, we can also point out that the aerospace industry has proved itself as the starting point of technological evolution in different scientific areas. We see that with this project, we have not only one purpose, but a bigger one. 
At the end of the day, we believe that this mission could have immediate impacts, especially in climate and monitoring ambits, and in long term, it can represent a leading change in Brazilian science. Keeping that in mind, we developed the Tupan project. In the Tupi Guarani mythology, Tupan is the messenger of the Supreme God and manifests himself as a thunder. Our mission is to be this messenger of what happens in Latin America's nature and borders. Given an overview of Tupan's specifications, in the presentation you can see its mass and dimensions. Its payload is projected to work on a low Earth orbit and can carry up to 150 kilograms. The electronic systems of the vehicle are divided into three areas. First, there's telemetry, which, cons which is responsible for data monitoring and using a group of sensors and transmitters that emit data, which are received by the ground station. Then we have the control, which by definition controls the engine, trajectory, and parachute ejection systems, and works with data provided by sensors, activating the actuators such as valves and igniters. Finally, there's the flight termination system, which uses the previous two systems and is responsible for a port aborting flight in case of critical failure. Tupan has two stages. The first stage is equipped with nine RP-1 or LOX engines as the main engine. Each engine can input up to 25 kilonewtons of thrust and fuel and an oxygen, oxygen are pressurized into the combustion, combustion chamber by an electric powered pump. The main engine is filled with eight tons of propellant and shall carry the second stage above the Kármán line. Tupan's parachute system is designed to ensure a safe landing for an approximate mass of 0.82 tons. This system is critical for the return of part of our launch vehicle and our operation crew safety. While a cluster of ring slot drogues is ejected at 10 kilometers of altitude, a cluster of two rift ring sail mains is ejected only at 7 kilometers. Additionally, there are four ring slot pilot chutes, one responsible for improving the, the deployment of each parachute. Aiming to guarantee a safe landing speed of 10 meters per second or less without steep opening forces, both mains have dual disc reef stages. Finally, an airbag light system is activated for the vehicle to float after splashdown or to soften touchdown impact. The second stage is coupled with one single RP-1 or LOX engine with the same specifications. This stage carries up to two tons of propellant and is responsible for the circularization and hormone transfer maneuvers. For a 150 kilograms of payload and 2,000 kilometers high orbit, the engines must be filled to full capacity. The main engine burn shall bring the rocket to a parabolic path with apogee of 164 kilometers. During the first burn, max Q and main engine cutoff cut happens. The first stage will be immediately deployed and the second engine start begins. This burn shall produce a circular orbit at the apogee altitude and also perform the first maneuver of the Hohmann transfer. Then we will have the fairing deployment and sequel. Later, the second maneuver for the second stage will happen, followed by the second engine cutoff. The payload deployment will occur, and this configures the end of mission schedule. For lighter payloads and lower orbits, the engines may carry less propellant. Hello, I'm Laura, and I'll be presenting the solution defense. Once we presented our main technical project, is the moment you ask why a solution is the best answer to solve this question. Firstly, we see that the impact that we can generate in each of the places where we plan to do manufacturing and get supplies. In addition, we recognize that our strategy and plan of execution are very applicable and bring a lot of innovations with it. Moreover, we also see that the project logistic and operation as a pioneer and unique solution uh, as it is, the, uh, it is faster and more economic than other similar projects, uh, can be executed easily and represents a lot in Latin America's aerospace and science industry. Uh, last but not least, we develop a website with a deeper explanation of a project for our potential customers to have this. Uh, you can scan the QR code and you will be redirected to the website. For more precise cost estimation, we relied mostly on parametric model for early phase development described at the 17th European Conference for Aeronautics and Space Sciences. Basically, the model relies on three parts, development costs, uh, generated based on historical data of material costs per mass and some design, engineering, TIL factors, manufacturing costs, also based on cost per mass historical data and learning disponibility TIL factors as well. Uh, and operational costs to be divided in ground operations, mission and flight operation, propane costs and indirect costs. With the aid of these tools, the total cost for the first launch was estimated in 169.23 million million reais. And why did I say first launch? Because one of our objectives is to build one model of rocket and operation that is safer, quicker, and more economical. So we also expect the cost to downgrade with the knowledge acquired in development and manufacturing, as predicted by the parametric model, resulting in more affordable launches as time goes by, as is shown in the graphics. 
for our logistics, we will develop an interface control document providing a register of all information about the interfaces generated for the project. Uh, at this point, simulations for all physical stresses suffered by the payload alongside with couple loads analysis will be done to understand how it will dynamically interact with the vehicle. As soon as the contract is signed, the launch of construction operation shall begin. And then the next phase is implementing the uh, implementations of flight simulations uh, regarding the trajectory and orbital analysis, engineering simulations, and the definition of the launching window. After the current approval of these results, uh, we begin the empirical test to validate them and then verify all licenses and articles. For payload rocket integration and launch, uh, it will be confirmed that the rocket and the payload are ready, as well as the launch date. The mission details uh, are checked, and the payload is sent to the launch location, and then later integrated to the rocket. Uh, the last revisions are made, and the launch chronology begins. Uh, about our manufacturing process, uh, it begins about five months and a half before the launch, uh, and the process takes about three months to get done. The parachutes will be on fabrication, just as airbag, a rocket fuselage, and motor. The electronic system will be manufactured by an external company, and it's an exception. Uh, the trans about the transportation, before launch, we'll be using the Air Force Fighting Jet C-130 Hercules, which was utilized for the VAR's launch, uh, which is a rocket uh, very similar to our own. And for the transportation after launch, to recover the first stage from the sea, we will be, uh, we'll be counting with marine support. Uh, we have a vast list of suppliers as shown in the PowerPoint, uh, but our network goes beyond that. Brazil has one promising field for university and research centers for diverse areas, including aerospace engineering, such uh, as ETA, FMG, and FMA, which will be used as a uh, seed force for this project. Uh, about the operations, we will be launching uh, from the Alcantara Launch Center, the CRA which has a strategic location to position satellites in orbit. The center's know-how in operation and launching space vehicles, as well as its safety procedures, makes it an ideal location for the two project. Uh, the CLA Operational Safety Manual is the center's main document, and it guarantees the safety and success of the mission, presenting guidelines for workplace safety, as well as operational characteristics for customers. Uh, it, it was also presented as our suggested model, and it was previously tested by the center, adding reliability and security to this operation. The chronology is crucial not only for the operation organization, but also for personal safety. Our document com comprised T minus three hours before launch to T plus one and a half hours after the engine sequence starts. Chronologically, the events can be divided into four blocks. Uh, vehicle activities, flight condition analysis, fueling and ignition, and stage recovery. Uh, to sum up, we recognize uh, the importance to review our strategic model to see what was our main features. In the beginning, we spent a little too much time uh, in organizational ideas. Uh, but it came up as a good thing in the end, once we had a lot figured out and uh, it was easier to work on it. Looking back, we see that adopting the mirror software was a crucial point to our project, uh, as we were able to visualize and divide tests better and faster. Uh, to conclude the presentation, we would like to thank the last organization and all those who are watching it for the opportunity and the attention. And always remember that science is fine science, and that's what we're doing here. Thank you. Nice, Laura. Congratulations. Nice, nice. Laura and Eduarda, your presentation was uh, amazing. And uh, uh, before the question and answers, I want to point out something very interesting. Um, we have more or less an average of 13% of women uh, participating in the Latin American Space Challenge 2020 edition. And uh, for me and for our team, we are very glad for having you. Laura, Eduarda, and Fernanda presenting the challenge for us today. So this is a, a we are very happy for this. So uh, we have a few questions here. So starting for the the first question, uh, probably uh, this is a, a little bit uh, technical, and I don't know if you had the time to think about it. But uh, you said in your technical presentation part that the uh, the pump for the the Dumont engine will, will be electrical so uh, the batteries for this electrical pump uh it could be disposed during the launch for for example uh the same thing like occur with the rocket lab or it 
could be like integrated and you recover after during the special round for for example well i think i may answer that um, we didn't go through every single detail about this design we actually got the rutherford engine from rocket lab as inspiration from it and the idea is just to maintain the battery inside each engine and therefore it would recover only the nine main engines batteries actually it's just one battery for one pump but is the nine engines that just clarified it okay nice nice answer thank you so much luis felipe um the second uh question is more or less about uh, the uh, uh business model uh, that you said maybe this could be launched before august 2021 so in the realistic way uh what do you think about launching this before 2021 and if not it's possible when do you think that it could be possible Well, um, I don't know if Laura would like to answer that, but uh, the the logistic and every op uh, operation uh, step uh, were predicted to uh, to allow a launch in the uh, given data. Uh, if I remember well, it's August August twenty one. Uh, that is for just just the first launch, as we well explained in the uh, in the presentation. After that, we could uh, just manufacture it and uh, imitate all the operation in a faster scale and this would allow for future launches i don't know if laura would like to uh, add uh, any comments on this uh, i don't know if i get the question right but um the for this first launch we're planning uh, exactly the launching on august 20 uh, august 2021 really uh, but what was mentioned is that once we get the development and the manufacturing and the learning from that, we could make it a little bit faster. We didn't make the calculation of how fast that could be, but it's a possibility, we think. Okay, thank you so much for the answer, Luis Felipe and Laura and Eduarda. Thank you so much for the uh, great presentation. It was amazing to, to watch your presentation. So we are very happy to have our project, project Jupiter with us uh, in the Latin American Space Challenge. Uh, thank you so much. Good luck. And uh, we will be uh, uh, talking together probably during the hour ceremony. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And we are back with our pod sessions. Now we have Minerva Rockets from UFRJ again. Now it's Team 26. They they are participating on the three kilometer Cubisat launcher uh, on the hybrid and liquid propulsion uh, category. Uh, they are from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. We are here uh, together with Gabriel as well. So Gabriel, thank you very much for, for coming. And we are excited to see your presentations. And as soon as you are ready, please go on. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll start right now. Um, hello, good afternoon. My name is Gabriel, and I am one of the co-founders of Grand Space, a new space startup. We formed in 2015 from the UFRJ Space Research Group, and we aim to create cheap but functional alternatives in the Brazilian aerospace market. Our company specialized in the design of CubeSats, and now, with this project, we will start to walk into a new road full of possibilities. So this is the structure of the current presentation. We identified some problems, which I'll talk about in a moment, proposed a solution, studied its financial and technical feasibilities, and elaborated its execution. Historically, only countries like the United States and Russia had both the human talent and financial resources necessary to explore space. But times have changed, and with the transition from a predominantly state-run industry to one managed by the private sector, the South American continent is presented with a special opportunity. The expectation of an increasing demand for space services, particularly monitoring, will imply a significant expansion of investments in the Latin American space sector in the long term. We have seen in recent history the participation of new countries in space exploration, such as Israel and India. With the Artemis 3 mission, which aims to reach lunar soil in 2024, the opportunity arose for us to send a 5 kilograms payload to the moon in what will be the first Brazilian representation in another celestial body. Thinking about the responsibility we have with this project, we took the opportunity to try and solve three great, great problems. First, space exploration, as it is made today, is highly expensive. Second, Latin America cannot continue to lag behind in this sector. Third, there is a major deficiency in STEM education in Latin America countries, where STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Aiming simultaneously at these three problems, we came up with an innovative solution, a cube rover. Luna Cube, as we call it, is based on a cube rover project developed by Astrobotic, the same company responsible for building Viper, the exploratory rover NASA will send on the Artemis mission. Our model is, at the same time, light and functional, and our objective is to give schools and universities real-time access to the rover. It will be able to perform a list of different activities, thus acting as a virtual lab in a way that has never been done before. This solution tackles those three problems I just presented to you in a full innovative way. As the weight of the cube rover is very small in compared to the other scientific experiments sent today to the moon, its cost is also reduced. This could be the gateway for countries that are not so rich to also participate in space exploration. At the same time, we approach education and are creating a way to bring the multi-million dollar endeavor that is space exploration to universities and mainly to schools. This democratizes the highest level present technology and also can show our youngest generation what can be achieved with science. An introduction to STEM educational areas at an early age is fundamental to a healthy economical environment and doing it in an exciting way is a form to engage kids' attention and retain people that already have enrolled in a STEM course. After all, a big question that a lot of people have when confronted, when confronted with mathematics, physics and chemistry is, okay, but for what will I ever use this for? Well, we now present you the answer. So, just recalling the mission, Artemis will launch to the moon in 2024 and we will be coming along. There, our cube rover will be deployed on the surface of the lunar south, south Pole and we will be ready for control. It will take cameras to enable the movement and analysis of the path and tools necessary for conducting different scientific experiments. Telemetry will allow this information to be sent to Earth and explored by teachers and educators. Since we will be entering the educational markets, every school and university is a potential client. We gather here the numbers of schools and higher education institutions in Brazil. Together, there are almost 185,000 educational institutions, which are responsible for over 56 million students. And this reason extends to every other country we wish to bring our product to. Having already determined that our project for the Artemis 3 mission would be the Cube Rover, we began to prototype what its mechanical, electronical, and software aspects would be. 
It will consist of a light and strong material that will resist the environment, and it will also have thermal control, essential for the protection of the electronic components. Our thermal control is based on some NASA references. The outside walls are a multi-layer isolation adaptation with Mylar and Captain tape, and that's why our cube rover has the color. The inside walls are filled with aerogel, which is a thermal and electronical electrical insulator. The heat exchanger is made of a pipe that pipe heat plate and a heat sink fixed with a copper plate on the top. This plate is covered externally with a coating, which increases emissivity for your irradiating heat. Its dimensions will be to you, and inside you to inside you will carry its avionics, an autonomous but also capable of being controlled remotely. The system's energy is provided by solar panels, and below them there's a copper plate, which has the function of not letting its temperature go too high, then increasing its efficiency. The wheels are rotated by motors attached to them and are controlled by a system which provides motion in all directions. The communication with Earth allows the rover to be used in real time for educational projects, as a teaching guide can be developed ranging from the movement of the rover to the experiments it can carry out. Having defined what we consider to be the essentials for the technical aspect of the product, we started making a mechanical and electronic analysis and gathered the weight of each of the components that will be necessary for its construction. Okay, so now talking about financial, our business model has six pillars. First, cost structure, which includes the product development costs, technical scene, and research laboratories. Second, key metrics, such as project maturity, resources, added value, and technical excellence. Third, our customer segment, which is, co which is composed of Latin American institutes of technology, universities, high schools, government agents, and Latin American and foreign aerospace industry. Fourth, our vision of democratizing access to scientific knowledge. Fifth, technological solutions that impact the society and are a brand new disruptive space mission concepts. And finally, our strategic planning that is re responsible for the logistics, re logistics of operations in Latin America. Our estimated investment is $8.25 million. Of this amount, 72.7% is the launch operation cost, 18.2% R&D costs, and 9.1% surface operations. For the Cube Rover development process, we adopted the TRL, Technology Readiness Level Scale, and we can say that the advantages are clear enough for, for process management in R&D and decision-making support. As you can see here in our timeline, we started our basic research in 2019, advanced it to TRL3, and we are currently in the applied research stage as indicated by TRL4. Our strategic analysis was made following the SWOT technique. We identified our positive features to be associated with our simple design, which enables low prices, and our negative features to be associated with the originality of the operation and the competition we may find with other companies. Here we show in greater detail the risks that we may incur, the likelihood of this event becoming a reality, and how we manage the situation. The biggest problems that we may find are competition with other businesses in the same area of, of virtual labs and technical problems with the rover. We solved them by showing our unique characteristics to clients and investors and by testing our, our products extensively. As our products has a major educational potential, our main customers will be federal and state governments and educational institutions, both pu public and private. Here you can see a few separated as an example. The main way that organizations can hire us is through our rent subscription, in which they rent a monthly or yearly package so that schools in the area can have access to the service. We will also have an individual purchase system where the client only pays for the service the amount of time they will use. Uh, okay, so this is our current scene. I would like to thank all of them for the amazing work they have done in putting together this idea. And these are our advisors. I thank them for the support they have given us in this journey. This was our, this was our presentation for you. I hope you liked it. And on behalf of the team, we want to thank you for the opportunity to introduce Grant Space and what we have achieved so far. We count on you to help to be able to improve access to education and technology development in Latin America. How about we change that reality together? Thank you, Gabriel from Minerva. Now uh, we'll be handling the questions for the security session. Um, we have a question from the last team and they like to know um, what is the what is the potential of what can the lunar regolith uh, do to, to the proposed rover that, that you 
you did here. Do you uh, took some time to think about uh, what the, the lunar regolith, the dust, uh, the moon dust, what it can do to your uh, rocket? But to your to your rover, uh, sorry. Okay, so the main problem associated with moon regolith is probably on the solar panel. It can be, it can accumulate on the solar panel and does uh, diminish the total life uh, time of the, the lunar rover. Uh, to solve that, we thought of uh, adding a, a type of motor to the solar panel, which will be on top, and it, the solar panel can then uh, go up and down and shake this so, uh, lunar regolith of it, and then it won't, it won't be a, a problem anymore. Thank you. I don't think we have any more questions here. So, on behalf of Lask, I'd like to thank you guys for participating and thank you for the great presentation that, that you did here. It's sort of, it was a really great product with uh, SWOT analysis and everything else. So, yeah, we were really pleased with everything we saw here. Thank you again uh, from the Lask team and thank you, Minerva UFRJ, for your participation. Thank you.
Hey everyone, welcome back. We are doing our 2020 Latin American Space Challenge conference. The teams are presenting their amazing work, proposing solutions for our challenges. And uh, this day is amazing because we had uh, uh, read many presentations that proposed uh, brilliant solutions and um, we will have more presentations but now we will have team number eight Equipe Lufti, Lufti team talking about their proposition about the deforestation in the Amazon they will be talking Portuguese this is going to be a nice presentation so the Lufti team is from Federal, uh, Fluminense Federal University from Rio de Janeiro. So now I will introduce them themselves in Portuguese. Agora, a partir de agora, a gente terá o time número 8, a equipe Luft, falando sobre a deflorestação, o deflorestamento da Amazônia. É uma ótima, uma ótima uh, desafio que eles vão propor uma solução. Então, em, em alguns segundos, a gente vai ter a Letícia, o Leo e o Marcos falando sobre essa solução, tá bom? Então, a partir de agora, Letícia, a palavra é com você. Boa sorte, você tem 10 minutos. Obrigada. Boa tarde, pessoal. Então, a floresta amazônica, que é o maior bioma existente e que influencia no clima, no planeta Terra, vem sofrendo, e não é de hoje, inúmeras ocorrências de desmatamentos e queimadas. Em outubro desse ano, os satélites do INPE, Instituto Nacional de Pesquisas Espaciais, detectaram um avanço de 836 quilômetros quadrados de florestas desmatadas, né? ultrapassando os recordes de 2019 e, assim, afetando todos os seres vivos. Isso devido à falta de políticas públicas que visam a fiscalização do bioma. O desenvolvimento da indústria aeroespacial de monitoramento teve um avanço recorde, comparando a períodos anteriores e agora para o objetivo civis, e agora para o objetivo civil, já. Antenas com grande cobertura, alta precisão, peso leve, alta rigidez e microsatélites que permitem alta qualidade de comunicação para monitoramento em tempo real. Tamanho cada vez mais reduzido, custo relativamente baixo e altamente reativo ao território para detecção precoce de desastres naturais humanos, agrícolas e anomalias. Faz uma estratégia faz uma estratégia possível para a preservação deste bioma mundialmente importante. É, esse ano, né, acho que a maioria que sabe, que se mostrou mais do que nunca que é a hora de se ter uma visão para o solo amazonense, né? já que o número de queimadas e desmatamentos na Amazônia aumentou muito. É, nos próximos slides a gente vai conseguir ver o, o gráfico que vai mostrar essa diferença. A Amazônia já tem já tem mais incêndios em 2020 do que o ano passado todo. Essa informação a gente pegou referente ao mês de outubro, né? Os incêndios eles vêm crescendo mês após mês desde julho deste ano. É, pode passar o slide, por favor? Então, nesses dois gráficos a gente consegue ver a diferença, né? Como veio crescendo o, a queimada na Amazônia e também o desmatamento. A diferença do desmatamento é realmente gritante de um, de um ano para o outro. Eu acho que a apresentação caiu. Caramba.
continuando, né? Com isso, uh, podemos concluir que existe uma dificuldade de descatalogar desmatamentos queimados por via terrestre, sendo necessário olhar de cima. Assim, o nosso projeto tem como objetivo melhorar o monitoramento desses desastres da seguinte forma. Fazer uma constelação de satélites de 7 a 10 CubeSats, 3 mil, já que CubeSats tem um custo mais barato do que os outros tipos de satélites. Esses satélites irão captar determinadas áreas da Amazônia totalmente estratégicas. Junto a isso, vamos criar um aplicativo onde as comunidades ribeirinhas e povos originários, ONGs que atuam na área de proteção ambiental e até mesmo as forças armadas pudessem mandar alertas de desmatamento, de queimada ou até de outros tipos de emergência que tivesse ocorrendo no local, com o objetivo até de fazer uma integração territorial e cultural. Essa informação ela seria cruzada e validada com as informações que os satélites da NASA e do INPE disponibilizam para a gente. Agora eu vou deixar com o Neuro. É, já posso falar? Ah, beleza. É, então, dando continuidade aqui na Letícia, o que a Letícia é, é, introduziu para vocês aí, as, as, as características técnicas principais é, dos CubeSats desenvolvidos, eles, eles se resumem a CubeSats de 3U, 2,5 e 3U, é, eles possuem uma capacidade de transmissão de subida de dados, né? que a gente entende que, que a, 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 a quantidade de dados consumida maior seria no envio de alertas e, e de emergências, assim como a, a, a de, de... só que em contrário, né? a, o sistema downlink do CubeSat, ele possui uma capacidade de meio megabyte, levando-se em conta a questão do georreferenciamento que é necessário e posteriormente vai ser, vai ser mais bem explicado. É, pode passar o slide, por favor? Bem... Esse aí é, seria um formato do CubeSat, a, a proposta é que a gente consiga ter um CubeSat é, de uma vida útil é, bem extensa, assim como a própria, o próprio formato de otimização dos, dos CubeSats em relação ao veículo lançador. A ideia é ter um CubeSat não tão pequeno, mas um CubeSat robusto que consiga ter todas as, as, atenda a todas as necessidades é, que são requeridas naquele, naquele espaço remoto que é a Floresta Amazônica e todo, todos os estados que acompanham essa, essa região que vai ser demonstrada. Pode passar, por favor. Bem, aí a gente consegue demonstrar muito bem é, qual que seria a, a área de cobertura do, do, do projeto. A ideia é que a gente atenda principalmente e, e desenvolva um trabalho importantíssimo com as reservas é, dos povos originários, assim como algumas comunidades ribeirinhas. E as escolhas dessas, dessas duas questões são muito ligadas à, à própria questão da integração é, com, 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 com esse povo que se, se organiza e se encontra lá, e bem como a, as comunidades ribeirinhas que ficam muito próximas aos, às, às nascentes dos rios e às, às regiões que são importantíssimas do ponto de vista de é, manutenção da vida, da vida orgânica né, da floresta amazônica. Pode passar. Esse aí é o custo envolvido do CubeSat, é, a gente entende que, devido a todas as condições que são necessárias para poder se colocar o CubeSat é, nessa localidade, assim como a própria instalação das estações terrestres, é, ele, é, tem um custo alto de, de inicial, mas em compensação o custo de manutenção do, dos, não só dos CubeSat, mas também das estações em terra, 
que vão estar integradas junto a essas comunidades que a gente mencionou anteriormente e fazendo delas, dessas comunidades uns agentes importantíssimos assim do ponto de vista da preservação da floresta. E assim como todo, toda a descrição da, das, da, das questões técnicas que envolvem o, o, o satélite e da utilização de, de uma segunda forma, além da própria telecomunicação, que é o, o sentido principal da missão, é de fazer é, a, aquela área de alguma, em algum certo nível ela acessível, não a, as redes de telefone em si, mas a, a sinais de emergência e sinais de desmatamento para a gente poder entender melhor como que é, consegue ser a prevenção e tentar fazer uma análise interessante, mas também do ponto de vista de sensoriamento. A Letícia mencionou sobre o cruzamento de informações da validação dos dados fornecidos pelo satélite da NASA gratuitamente e também do INPE gratuitamente, mas o próprio, o pró a própria validação também envolve uma aquisição é, térmica não tão avançada quanto e desenvolvida quanto os satélites da NASA mas, e, da, e, e, do, e do INPE, no caso do Brasil, mas em algum certo nível conseguem mensurar algum tipo de sensibilidade térmica na região. Isso favorecendo ao, a, a compreensão do, do que seria o, a queimada e também o próprio desmatamento, porque a queimada é um método de desmatamento da floresta amazônica. Pode passar, por favor. É, esse aí seria uma, essa seria uma interface do nosso do, do layout é, do, do aplicativo. A ideia é que, como a gente mencionou, que a gente vai fazer desses do, do, dos residentes né, dentro da floresta, mas da, de quem realmente está lá dentro, agentes de preservação, a ideia é que existam não só um, um aplicativo em que esse aplicativo ele vai funcionar como um sinal de emergência de celular, só que não é lógico na frequência da, do, do, das antenas celular, de celular, mas um, como se fosse uma emergência. E a antena, essas super antenas, elas vão criar uma área de... de de uma área segura em que dentro dessa região é possível enviar um sinal de alerta, independente se você vai estar é, em loco na estação em terra, que nada mais do que é um dispositivo, uma caixa com três botões, dizendo que, simulando mais ou menos como está esse aplicativo aí, que um é, sinalizando que vai ser que é uma queimada, outro é um risco de, 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 de desmatamento, uma ameaça de está acontecendo um desmatamento naquele momento, e um outro uma qualquer outra emergência. A ideia é que dentro dessa, é, isso também ajude também, por exemplo, em caso de, de queda de aviões ou de pessoas se perdendo no meio da floresta, que isso possa também ser um porto seguro para essas pessoas que no, porventura venham se perder. Pode passar o slide, por favor. E assim termina a nossa apresentação. É, não sei se a gente tem alguma coisa a acrescentar, ou se o nosso tempo ainda está tem para acontecer. Não, nosso tempo acabou. Pessoal, parabéns pela apresentação, muito legal. O toda opa, desculpa, estou sem câmera aqui, voltei agora com câmera. Parabéns pela dedicação, é, parabéns pelo, pela apresentação que vocês fizeram, ficou muito legal. Esteve aí no meio do caminho, a conexão deu a caída aí do, do Marco, mas no fim voltou, Deus tá Deus. bom? Deu tudo tranquilo, muito legal. Parabéns pelo empenho, tá bom? É, e avante Luft, parabéns, tá bom? Agora eu vou falar em inglês para o nosso registro aqui, ok? So, uh, thank you, uh, Luft team, for the amazing presentation. It was uh, very interesting about the satellites, the deforestation, and the web app that Leo uh, presented to us. So, congratulations. Now, we are going to a little break, a small break, and we will return at 15.30 uh, Brazilian regional time. Thank you so much. And thank you to watch our Latin American Space Challenge Conference. See you.
Hello, everyone. We are back with the 2020 Latin American Space Challenge Conference. Uh, today, the teams are presenting their solutions for our challenge, the 2020 challenge. So now we will have the Team 37, Mission Beheta Sat 1. Uh, this is the, the name of the mission uh, that they, they had for the first part of the Latin American Space Challenge. The Arizona Space Technologies, uh, they are from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And now, today, they will be presenting the OLISAT-1, a yeah. challenge for, uh, proposition of solution for the challenge uh, for a, moni a satellite monitoring and a quick response for the Northeast Brazil oil spill. So, Today we have Carlos Gallo and Maximiliano with us. So, are you ready? Yes. Okay, you have 10 minutes to present your a solution. Good luck, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. You're well, welcome. Well, good afternoon to everyone. We are Arizona Space Technologies, and we are going to present our solution to the Brazilian Oil Spill Challenge. Next, please. So specifically, we are going to talk about a satellite-based solution that may help to solve a real-life problem, as you can see. We make R&D of space technologies and complex systems integrations. Next. The agenda of this presentation will follow this sequence. First, we will talk about the context of the problem, following a strategic analysis of it, and presenting our solution approach and its defense. And we will make some financial analysis and execution aspects. And finally, we will talk about our potential risks and present a strategic model for this project. So let's start with the context. Next, please. The problem is, well, it's defined around an oil spill in the Brazilian coast with an average size of 330 square kilometers. There is a need of monitoring the oil spill at least at every four hours. So we start um, with this data and, and we build a, a solution for this. Next, please. From the ITOPF, which is the International Tanker Owners Pollution Federation database, we can see that the trend of oil spill accidents tends to be low as decades advance. In this sense, our project, we believe, will be more a punctual solution for this specific problem, due to the fact of lack of demand according to this information. Next, please. Well, I'm going to talk about the solution approach of OILSAT-1. Our solution approach will be developing a two-unit CubeSat with heritage components, a Raspberry Pi, and its new high-quality camera model. It could be launched from an hypothetical local micro launcher, and we need a fast response. For example, the VLE from CONAE or Procyon from Lee Aerospace, that is a private company developing small satellite launchers. The project aims for a very low Earth orbit. We are pointing for an equatorial orbit, or equatorial orbit since the location of the spill is one degree over the equator line. This could be only be possible launch from Brazilian territory, especially the Alcantara launch center. The satellite will include an S-band radio transceiver with an estimated rate of one megabit per second downlink, a GPS, a high resolution camera model, active, alti oh, sorry, active altitude controls, and other electronics for the basic satellite functioning. Our solution tried to go for our three fundamental pillars, efficiency, safety, and low cost. Most important, we only have six weeks for doing this. At first, we started sourcing for commercial grade space cameras, but the lead time was over four, or sorry, for over eight weeks for that part alone. So our approach take, take advantage of the Raspberry Pi single board computer and its camera model, both widely available everywhere and with plenty of documentation and data. As for the Raspberry Pi, we ended up selecting the Raspberry Pi Zero. As for all of them, it's the one with less bare board power consumption and weight size relation. It only has one core and only half a gig of RAM, but it's okay for the purpose. The camera is using the new high quality camera model with a Sony IMX477 sensor, 1.55 micrometer pixel size, 12.33 megapixel resolution camera, and it allows us to change the lens depending on the deployment. Here we can see one of the possible altitudes about we can reach. Uh, of deployment, uh, the variation of pixel meters and the total horizontal kilometers per pixel. Uh, the different focal lenses of the lenses change and we can be able to change them at the use of any time of deployment. So we can know for sure uh, what attitude we are going. The grid you can see on the right is a concept of how we are going to transmit to the receiver the data. We take the full resolution picture, the 12 for, 30, for the 33 megapixels, and we downsize it to a more stable one. Then we get a grid on it 
and you can send it to the receiver to notice if you want the full picture, just a part of a grid or none at all. And down there, we have the different, different type of lenses we can add to the system. As you can see here, different altitudes gives us different lifetimes. The oil spills might last from two to five years. So we think that the best solution or thing to get it all working is about 400 kilometer height. So the oil spill would last about two to three years. So why not using Beretta Sat1 or any other pocket cubes as we might have developed before for this contest and even from our personal project? Well, Beretta Sat1 is a touch demonstrator. Its systems were not proven in space, so its camera can take high resolution photos too and send them due to the low hand the, sorry, due to the low bandwidth use. Uh, so its passive attitude control system could have problems too in an equatorial orbit as we have selected for this solution, difficulty in the capture of photographs. And most lens are too big and heavy for it. We decided to build a CubeSat from modular parts and quick integration, perhaps more expensive than the RetaSat one, but at least with some components to be tested. About the next, please. The financial analysis, we believe in space democratization. We don't want uh, to make a business from an environmental catastrophe, but funds are needed. The estimated cost of the satellite will be $80,000, including an estimated deployment cost of $25,000. Some other costs, such as the place of assembly, are expected to be covered using universities, equipment, or even from CONAE or AIB. Next, please. Here you can see the execution of the mission, from gathering and assembling, testing, integration, launch, deployment, and control. We are not considering the legal issues about the license for operating the satellite, which usually takes more than six weeks. Next, please. There are some potential risks, as you can see here in the slide, from making this mission, since a large failure to premature the orbit and lifetime and malfunction of the systems. But most important, the heritage components could be delayed too. Next, please. Finally, we talk about our strategic model. We aim to develop an, an ad hoc strategy with a mission defined under our three fundamental pillars, which lead to specific goals and then giving results to the Brazilian government and other actors. From this, we get feedback for redefining, if necessary, this strategy. Next. So this, this is some reference we have used. And we'd like to thank you all for this moment and for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Maximiliano and Carlos. It was amazing. And uh, you showed to us something that we were like expecting, uh, something uh, focused on the responsiveness for the launch and uh, for monitoring this. And you went to to find solutions on the uh, COT market, for example, and uh, after the SROD solution. That's uh, something that uh, you, if you can't go and just buy, you can produce something like develop. Yeah. So this was very, very interesting. From the last team, we do not have any questions. Uh, I just want to, to congratulate uh, both of you for the presentation, for the amazing work that you guys are doing, not only in this presentation, for, but from the beginning of the 2020 Latin American Space Challenge. Congratulations, and uh, it is amazing, the high quality of the work that you bring every presentation to us. So that's it. Congratulations. Obrigado. Thank you. Obrigado. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
and we are back for the challenge presentations. Now we are we have Team ID 16 Beyond Rocket Design. They will talk about the deforestation in the Amazon. And we have here Luis and and Rafael uh, from Beyond. They they are going to talk about the team. So uh, Luis, Rafael, the word is with you, please. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Luis Guilherme. Hello, my name is Rafael. You are from Beyond Rocket Design, and today we will present our project Niban from the solution to the challenge of monitoring the deforestation of the Amazon biome. So, who sees the great Amazon rainforest may have the impression that it's something inexhaustible and really incredible. However, it happens that deforestation is one of the main human interventions that harms the ambiental sustainability of this huge rainforest. But what can this generate? As you can see in the pictures, these deforestations end up culminating in a big ambiental imbalance and provoke some loss of biodiversity and ending up in extinction of species. The animation presented can be scary, right? The amount of this deforestation already consumed 20% of all Amazon, a massive number. If the situation continues the same, the loss of the rainforest can provoke consequences that would affect not only the local biodiversity, but would have economic and social impacts too, including the increase of cases of infectious diseases. The graphic presented is from Terra Brasilis Portal, a web platform developed by INPI. In the graph, the green columns indicate the increase in the in deforestation in, on the last decade, compare areas and years. You can see that the area deforestated almost doubled in 10 years, giving us an idea of how dangerous the current situation is. The causes of deforestation are diverse, but most, most of it in the Amazon occurs outside the law, caused by illegal human activities. Some big impacts of deforestation are soil degradation, erosion, loss of biodiversity, climate changes, loss of hydrological cycle and social impacts. Summing up, the forest in the Amazon is a way to put our planet in a really bad condition that can soon bring, bring us undesirable consequences, consequences. It's about time for us to change this reality. So our solution is based on monitoring the deforestation using a small satellite constellation. This way, it is possible to identif identify illegal deforestation and act punctually to reduce as much as possible the number of those occurrences. Therefore, we will be able to avoid a possible irreversible ecological global disaster. But how? Using remote sensing, they are capable of collecting, collecting, of collecting energy from the object, converting it into a signal that can be registered and presenting it in the suitable form for the extraction of information. The first step is to choose the type of sensor. There are two types, the passive and the active. A passive sensor uses the sunlight to obtain images. Meanwhile, the active sensor have the ability to send electromagnetic energy capable of passing through clouds, allowing it to operate in adverse conditions. So we evaluated both types of sensor based on ability to monitor, bandwidth, and resolution. Analyzing the passive sensor, we concluded that if you use this type of sensor, Due to the excess, uh, excess, sorry, due to excessive number of clouds along the year in the forest, it would only present good images from June to August, a very short period period of time. Therefore, due to the climate conditions of the Amazon forest, the chosen sensor type was the active sensor named SR. In the table presented, there are some important data followed by the benefits brought by the sensor that includes independence of independence of the climatic condition ability to monitor at night, and big variety of applications. In addition, we have an infrared sensor to obtain temperature data of the entire forest. With that, we can, we can detect pos possible Ill illegal Amazon burns too. With the specifications from the SAR sensors and the infrared, it was possible to define the orbital parameters. As the altitude of the stars is 690 kilometers, the height was also considered as the orbital altitude for the satellite. In addition, some tests were done to choose the inclination angle of the orbit through the STK simulator 
that is a platform for analyzing and visualizing aerospatial missions. This way, after several tests of different orbital inclinations, the chosen angle inclination that best contemplates the forest area was 18 degrees. Now, the constellation took shape. With the wide range of 250 kilometers obtained by the sensor, the simulation point out the need to use four satellites so that there were no gaps in the monitoring process. Besides that, defined and analyzing the orbital parameters, we can capture two images per day. We estimate that each of those satellites will have approximately 100 kilograms and will be in the microsatellite category. By our research and studies on older missions with microsatellites, we stipulate that each of them will have a lifespan of approximately two years. So in order to always renew the satellites in the constellation, it will be necessary to have a ratio of launch of this time stipulated. After the satellite sensors get the data, they need to send it to a station on the ground so that the information can be processed and used. For this, we will use the Alcantara and the Cuiabá ground stations to receive the information from the satellites, taking advantage of the installations that IMP already owns and uses. Now, with the data in hand, we might imagine how difficult it is to control the immensity of the Amazon region and how long would it take to analyze and process. The numbers are huge. For that, we can count on artificial intelligence. See an example. The imagine from GOI satellite would take about 243 days to analyze manually. Now, using an AI, IMP has reduced that time to a few hours. So the speed of mapping and detecting the flood station is much faster using artificial intelligence. The orange outlines in the following figures were made by a human. Meanwhile, the green outline were made by artificial intelligence. AI analysis is similar, but even more accurate. We can also use artificial intelligence to predict deforestation, urban progress, and even burns. So the problem of dealing with huge areas is solved. We can know in a diverse the where to act and centralize preventive actions in the same way as a crystal ball. This is the chronogram of our mission. By some analysis, we stipulate that we, if we begin the execution of the project in February of 2021, we would have the satellites ready for launch in March of 2023. The estimated budget is based on existing satellites of the same type and which have already been launched. Thus, there are about $30 million for the launch and about $70 million for the development of the satellite. Therefore, the project MIBAN is a great investment since this is a project focused on the Amazon rainforest with the reliability and the efficiency using cutting edge and technology that bring a great accuracy to the process. The project came with the purpose of showing the importance of taking care of this biome who has been careless and despised. Not satisfied with everything we already brought, this mission contains the artificial intelligence and automation in data analysis. Because when we talk about our great wealth, the time can't be lost. And certainly, with the work that this team has been doing improving, we can break limits in sustainability. Go beyond. If you want to know more about us or have doubts, here is our contacts. And that's all. And we appreciate your attention. OK, Rafael, Luis, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really good. Uh, uh, I saw that you covered almost everything that uh, science, the technical aspects from the operational and, and, and cost analysis as well. So uh, I, I have a question that is more related for, for the technical aspect. I, I saw that you, you, the team did some simulations for, for the orbital parameters to achieve the best uh, coverage for the Amazon region. 
And my question is, uh, how was the process to to get this orbital parameter? So uh, you guys try to optimize the coverage, and uh, was you analyzing for uh, for one day period or for uh, uh, how how long was the period that you guys analyzed in the software that you used? And uh, how was the process to get this orbital parameter? So you are trying error, or, or you guys try to uh, maxim maximize the inclination to get a more a polar orbit, or how, how was the process? Well, we started with uh, uh, we research and the, we obtain uh, uh, dates for other satellites that we observe. And based on them, we create uh, the initial uh, constellation, our initial constellation, and then we try and error. We addition or, or remove some satellites and see if it worked or not, and it was this way. And about the angles, we tried as, uh, several angles and we were in, in the simulator, and we just keep the changing and watching what was happening. And we tried a lot of different angles until we we saw what was the best, what was the angle that covered the most of the, the rainforest. Ah, okay, perfect. Uh, that was re really great. Uh, well, let me check if we have any other question. Okay, uh, I think is that we don't have any additional question. Uh, again, uh, congratulations for all the Beyond uh, team. It was a, a great presentation, and uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. We appreciate.
aqui with Team ID 07, Capital Rocket Team from Brasilia. They will talk about the challenge satellite monitoring for Northeast Brazil oil spin. We have here Fernando Barroso and Rafael Pinheiro. Uh, they will represent Capital Rocket Team for this presentation. Rafael, Fernando, the word is with you, and thank you very much for participating. Hey, thank you. The pleasure is ours. So yeah, today we're going to talk about satellite monitoring for the Northeast Brazil oil spill. So first of all, let's talk about the problem specifically. Uh, we all know that oil spills pose a huge threat to the environment, especially to marine ecosystems. So last year we had a major oil spill in the northeast waters of Brazil that affected all nine states of the northeastern region. And a week ago, a new oil slick was detected in coordinates north. And remember very well how bad of an impact that uh, last year's event had on the environment on people who depend on these environments so fishermen and people who work in the tourism sector for example so um we, we knew this uh we know this from experience and we know how important it is to develop a time effective solution to tackle the situation so our solution is to develop a small set that will monitor the affected area and assess the authorities to uh, help contain this oil, uh, this oil spill and prevent the situation from getting even worse. So let's talk more, let's go into more specifics about our solution. Well, first of all, we had to determine orbit parameters, which are key if you want to understand how the satellite in, uh, really works, really functions. So since uh, this is a very time sensitive situation, so the sooner we launch the satellite, the better, the faster we can contain the situation and prevent it from getting even worse. So um, simplicity is a major factor here. So that's why our team chose a circular orbit. So that is an orbit with zero eccentricity. Well, with regards to the altitude, we all know uh, that a requirement, the major requirement for this mission was that it had to deliver images, new data, at least every four hours. So this sets a limit to the maximum altitude for the satellite at about 5,200 kilometers. But with simulations using the STK software, our team found out that uh, an orbit with an altitude of about 1,000 kilometers was enough to cover all the affected area. So this video there shows the orbit, which is circular. Um, we are launching from the Kuhu station in the French Guiana, and we can see that it's enough to communicate with the ground station in Brasilia. And this other video here shows the ground track of the satellite, which is the projection of the satellite onto the Earth's surface. So we can see that it passes over the target uh, in the northeast in uh, the coordinates given, and it also communicates with the ground station in Brasilia. Well, um, so the simulation using the SDK software gave us all these parameters, and with the altitude of 1,000 kilometers, we could determine the revisit time at about one hour and a half, one hour and 34 minutes. So this is this means actually that the satellite will give, uh, will uh, send us images, new data, much more often than the minimum required, which is really good. And we also could calculate all these other parameters, such as mean time above target and orbit insertion time. Okay, so going on to the advantages of why to develop a satellite solution. So uh, satellites are uh, more competitive when compared to plane operations, for example, when it comes to area monitoring when, when it comes to disaster monitoring. Because plane operations, although they do have a better response time and they are more efficient in the short term, they are more, more cost efficient in the short term, well, satellites have a much uh, broader field of view. So they can cover the whole disaster area at once in a single field of view, which is really good. So they are much more cost effective in the long term. And this uh, actually compensates for this low response time of the satellite. So when you're looking for not only tackling the situation, but preventing from happening again, and actually monitoring the whole, uh, the whole northeastern coast of Brazil, we can see clearly that satellite development is the best solution. So moving on to the details of our product itself, how it works on the inside, and how it will deliver us these images, this data. We can see the center of this diagram, OBC, which stands for um, Onboard Computer, uh, which will be an open, so uh, open source software, uh, extremely customizable 
that can uh, some uh, type of one size fits all uh, software that they can be customizable. And it, it's connected to all of these subsystems. We can start with the payload there, which is the camera we're gonna use. Um, it's gonna be the WFI camera, the same that was in, deployed in the Seabrus family of satellites and the same that will be used in the Amazonia One satellite in the future. So we know that it has been tested and validated. Now the TTNC which stands for telemetry tracking and command subsystem. This is a transceiver which will work in a radio frequency system um, communicate with the grass in Brazilian. Now moving on to the next one, we have the electrical power system, EPS, which will be um, solar panels that will charge a battery and, and then give the power to the satellite to uh, function and take these images. Now the next one would be the ADC, which stands for Attitude Determination and Control Subsystem. This image shows a magneto torquer, which is a device, well, explained various, in a very simple way, it's a device that interacts with the Earth's uh, magnetic field. And with this, it, it uh, produces useful torque to stabilize the satellite. So satellites usually use magneto torquers to be stabilized. Now, uh, of course, all this data collected in the satellite will be relayed to a ground station in Brasilia. In this image, we can see a raw image on top. Um, and then in the bottom, we have a processed image. This uh, composite image was actually uh, produced by a team member using a MATLAB software. So we can see the capability of uh, imaging processing nowadays. Now, Fernando will talk more about the our product in a more in a business perspective. Fernando? So talking a little bit the business, here in the center, we have the schedule of our task force that was divided in the six weeks. So the first one was the planning and definition and then uh, implementation and logistics. So a little about the launch and operations. We decided to use the Brazilian Air Force airplanes to ship our satellite to the launch site that we chose to be the uh, Guiana Space Center at Kuhu. And about the launch, we searched about Iron Space and SpaceX, but using Iron Space, it would be easier because of the they are near to the Brazil, and they can give our give us a better orbit. About our competitors, Rafael, Rafael already said, and the business model is focused on the mid term. So we try to to be more cheaper than a big satellite, but a little more expensive than a CubeSat. Um, about our social impacts, we plan to make our data public so people can develop many other solutions to, to help the monitoring OSPO. And the technology is focused on our, on our small revisit time. Then about the investments, our solution is estimated in $20 million. So it's including the satellite, the integration and test, the launch and the shipment to the launch site. Then about the risks, we divided in five. The first one is that the components of the satellite can be delayed and it will impact our integration. The second one is that the launch can fail, so our satellite will be lost. Then we have the bureaucracy that many companies here in Brazil need to fight against. And the fourth one is the shipment because we will be depending on the availability of the Brazilian Air Force airplanes. And the last is the sea visibility because to our satellite have a good efficient, we need to be in a good weather. So if the weather is so rainy or cloudy, our uh, efficient will be compromised. And basically, it was it. So thank you. It was a pleasure to, to be here presenting. And feel, feel free to ask us, to contact us. And that's it. Thank you. OK, Fernando. OK, Rafael. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Uh... OK, sorry, my camera was off. Thank you very much. 
uh, again great presentation i saw you you cover all the technical aspect i saw a great simulation from since the launch from the final uh final orbit you got the orbital parameters the reviews time uh, really good uh, for, from the business perspective also you you you, you guys did a, a great job covering uh, the aspects we have a a, a few questions uh, the first one is from our our, our teammate bruno costa uh, he's asking about uh, the responsiveness uh, about it uh, how long would it take from let's say uh, from the proposition to get the satellite in orbit uh, how long it will take to uh, uh, not only uh, develop the the final solution but build and launch so uh it, it, this is the first question and I, i'm gonna ask the second one together is uh, who who is gonna pay for the satellite so will be government or uh, as you said will be uh, the data will be available for everyone will be public but um who will be sponsor sponsoring the main sponsor for the project government private inst institutions so okay about the, the the launch and the time we try to plan our uh, task force in a way that we can uh, hypothetically launch the satellite in December 28 because Aryan Space have a, a launch schedule using the Soyuz rocket so we try to to plan the the mission to be launched in December 28 in 2020 so I think that Rafael can talk a little about the, the market and the sell the the informations. Yeah, I can answer the second question. Um, so uh, this is a topic that interests many organizations, interests the, the federal government. So we'll certainly have uh, sponsors, uh, basically uh, either private sponsors in, in the uh, private sector or um, in the public sector. So uh, the Ministry of Environment will be very interested in this project. The uh, IBAMA, which is the organization that cares for nurses uh, in, in Brazil. So other companies will be interested because this will not only uh, serve for this task, for this specific mission to uh, monitor this oil spill, but also it will serve to monitor the, the region. It can be, it can, the satellite is extremely uh, versatile. It can have, have other uses. Uh, such as um, communication and so it, it can I mean monitoring an area has much many more uses than just uh, containing an oil spill so certainly many companies many companies will be interested and especially the federal government perfect thank you thank you uh, Rafael thank you Fernando congratulations for the entire uh, the entire capital rocket team and for those who are watching us on live, stay with us. Uh, the next presentation will be soon. Thank you very much.
and we're back with the Latin America Space Challenge Pitch Deck uh, presentations. We're here with uh, Topos Projetos Aeroespaciais Team ID 14. They're going to talk about the responsive launch capability of small sets. And we're here with Arthur, Gabriel, Pedro, and Bruno. Hello, hello. You guys have 10 minutes for the presentation. Are you guys ready? Okay, so you guys have the word, please. So I think we lost Arthur. Uh, he will be back in a few seconds. So we had some technical issues, uh, and Arthur is already ready. So Arthur, you have the word. You have 10 minutes for your presentation, please. Good afternoon. My name is Arthur, and today we are going to present the Calango project. Starting by the name, Calango is a small reptile of the Brazilian fauna that, when necessary, is able to run incredibly fast, despite its small size. And this characteristic is the core of our project, a responsive launch service. Within the context of the new space, there's a market responsible for monitoring and research, such as, such as forest fires, oil spills, deforestation, and border control. However, many of these events are urgent and require agile and flexible launches. In order to supply this market, the Calango project intends to create a responsive small satellite launch vehicle capable of an incredible fast launch procedure within 72 hours in order to take advantage of any small launch window available. For this, in addition to the launch vehicle, the logistics for carrying out this feature were studied, together with the business model that demonstrates the project viability. For the concept of operations, the mission is to take small satellites of up to 150 kilograms to low Earth orbit in a precise orbit. So, the operation starts on the ground with assembly, transport, and launch preparations. Then, the two-stage launch vehicle takes off and accelerates upwards, perform the gravity turn until the main engine is cut off. Then, the two stages are the couple, the first one entering and splashing the sea, while the second stage, now with the engine running, continues to accelerate the vehicle. Upon reaching a certain altitude, with little remaining atmosphere, the fairings are ejected, exposing the payload. The second stage continues to circularize the orbit. Finally, after reaching the desired orbit, the payload is decoupled from the vehicle, and then, in order to ensure sustainability of the operations and reduce space waste, the second stage performs wreck to wreck to burn and re enters the atmosphere for its disposal. The design launch vehicle will be 50 meters high and have a diameter of 1.5 meters. It will have a gross liftoff mass of 10.6 tons and a thrust to liftoff weight of 1.54 and a payload fraction of 1.42%. For performance and complexity reasons, two stages of a liquid rocket engine were chosen, which allows an auto complex assembly in an accurate orbit. In order to increase the receptivity during assembly and launch operations, as well as to decrease the time required for these phases, both stages have a modular character that allows a previous and independent preparation of each one of them, contributing to the responsive scope of the project. In terms of material, the launch vehicle is made of carbon fiber, which has excellent structural properties while also being lightweight, ensuring an efficient vehicle, ensuring an efficient vehicle. Finally, it was designed to carry the payload to the LEO, here considered as an orbit of 300 kilometers. Given the nine-month deadline, the design and validation of a new engine wouldn't be possible, so in order to launch, launch on time, it was decided to acquire an, an already tested and validated rocket motor. Considering the available options, 
the Vortex rocket engines made by Sierra Nevada Corporation were chosen. They are low-cost and high-performance liquid motor due to its refriger refrigerating technology and also offer a wide range of nominal thrust options, which facilitates the design process. For the propellant, a combination of liquid oxygen with kerosene was chosen, which is a reliable propellant, propellant with high performance. For the first stage, it was chosen two motors producing 80 kN of thrust each, within a specific impulse of 300 seconds. And for the second stage, it was chosen one motor with a nominal thrust of 25 kN and a specific impulse of 353 seconds. The fairing is a structure that contains and protects the payload from the intense aerodynamic forces experienced by the vehicle during the flight. To do so, its design aimed to increase the vehicle aerodynamic efficiency and to have enough internal volume to contain the satellites. When the payload reaches the LEO after the second engine burnout, the separation process of the fairing will start. It consists of two pyrotechnical, pyrotechnical mechanisms detonating the, the hinges that support the fairing structures, leaving them free to separate and release the payload. Additionally, the mechanism used to fix the fairing in the payload facilitates the assembly procedure in the launch site. The Kalang will have a maximum payload of 150 kilograms, being able to carry a total volume equivalent to six 27U cube sets inside a base of 80 by 80 by 120 centimeters, especially designed to carry small satellites. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Pedro Pompeo. Uh, breaking a bit of infrastructure and logistics division, as our launch will be done in our country launch center in the state of Marion, we opted to host our facility in the capital of San Luis for its high technological development degree down to our country city. However, this has generated a few infrastructure problems. San Luis is located inside the island, so the fastest access from each to Alcantara would be through the bay inside a ferry boat. Inland, access is possible, although rather be prolonged. Knowing this, we opted for transporting the vehicle and equipment by ferry boat to save time. And for this decision, the vehicle was built so that its parts could be stored inside the containers. We opted for transportation fuel and oxidizer through land, as it presents lower environmental risk. Because of our nine month deadline, we elaborated the following schedule to ensure that the launch will occur in time. Our design phase will have a duration of four months, going from December to March. The test phase will happen on April and May. Finally, the construction and assembly will occur between the months of June, July, and August. The following infograph sorts our logistics plans in 10 stages, starting from truck loading inside the facility, through the arrival in the light center, and includes assembly, communication, checking of meteorological conditions, and finally, the launch authorization. With of all that, Considering the sum of each of the stage duration time, the total time for the logistics should be about 64 hours, discounting waiting time in between stages. Such as ferry boat waiting time as climatic conditions might delay the departure shared schedule. Now in this, the maximum period for embarking the ferry boat should be about 62 and half, and half hours before they schedule much time. In conclusion, all of the logistics could be done in less than three days. Firstly, my name is Bruno, and from this moment on, we will present our business model. The main proposal we have to present is our cash and care policy, which after signing the contract, our goal is to put the small satellite in orbit in just three months. Of this, associated with a small bureaucracy, real-time feedback, and above all, environment awareness as previously presented. In addition, another point to be addressed is the great branching of the types of the satellite that our launch vehicle is able to transport with its 150 kilograms payload, targeting both the monitoring area and the researching area as shown as in the diagram. Some examples are border control, space research itself, and also monitoring climate and biomes. 
In order, in order for us to carry out these projects, we will count on partners who are associated with the Brazilian government as AEB and FAB, or private partners such as suppliers and investors. Furthermore, the contract clause includes the monthly technical progress report, financial reports, a flexible launch window, solution solutions, and mainly the launch base already contracted, the Alcantara Space Center. Such clauses make our project as safe as possible for the contractor, from the first contact until the post-launch. Finally, here we show our respected cost for the project, $10 million for the launch vehicle, $2 million for logis logistics, and $1 million to, to pay other costs like unexpected ones, such as launch cancellations because of the bad weather. Thanks for watching. Do you have any questions? Okay, so thank you, Project Octopus, for your presentation. Uh, in my behalf, I think you guys uh, said about everything we, we decided. You talked about a little bit about Orbit, Conops, your vehicle details. You're going to use existing motors, your operational log logistics, business models. For me, uh, I don't have any question. I don't know if last team has any. But on, on behalf of our last team, I would like to thank you guys for your presentation and see you on the award ceremony at 8 o'clock. Thanks, guys.
Hello, everyone, and we are back after our break. This is the last part of the challenge presentations. We have the three, uh, uh, three more presentations. Uh, now we have Pedro, Gustavo, and Rafael from ITA Rocket Design, uh, São José dos Campos, São Paulo, Brazil. Uh, their team ID is 10, and they will talk about deforestation in the Amazon. Uh, this challenge uh, uh, will be presented by Pedro, Gustavo, and Rafael. And the word is with you guys. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Uh, good evening. We will now present our solution for the deforestation in the Amazon challenge. We will first talk about a bit of the introduction of this problem as it has been talked before by the other teams. The Amazon right now has been going through a very difficult time with deforestation and wildfires and more than 17% of the forest total area has already been cleared by this activity. Deforestation numbers have risen dramatically in the last couple of years, and this biome is critical to the Earth's climate and also to the Earth's biodiversity. Uh, in this presentation, we will go through this agenda talking about market research, about similar solutions for similar problems that have already been presented. We'll talk about our solution and the service it offers, and we also talk about the satellites and the constellation we will offer in our solution. We'll talk also about money, how much we expect to be invested in this solution, how we are going to implement it, and what risks we might face in the future for this project. So for our market research, we found three good examples of similar products. The first one being the GOES, the GeoRare satellite operated by an American agency. We also have to talk, of course, about the Brazilian Chinese corporation, the Cibers, which is an Earth imaging satellite. And the third market research we have is the Planet Labs 100 CubeSat constellation, which is also for Earth imaging. Uh, having this in mind, our solution is what we have called the Forest Program, Forest Observation Research Satellites, which will be a constellation of nine CubeSats to monitor the Amazon forest. We propose a cheaper than conventional and uh, more uh, cheaper than conventional, more complex satellites. The service we will be offering these satellites will be daily images of the entire Amazon region for deforestation tracking, automatic wildfire detection system, and easy access to most recent data via dedicated website and API. Right now, talking about the satellites themselves, we are planning on building six unit CubeSats. And since we want to innovate, but without having to reinvent the wheel, we're planning on using mostly commercial, commercially available components. This way, we could estimate a manufacturing cost for our satellites of around 2.5 million Brazilian reals, including labor costs as well. The payload is a multi-spectral camera, also commercially available. It is capable of optical and infrared imaging. It has a 9.6 meter resolution at 500 kilometers, and at the same altitude, it is possible of providing a 32 kilometer swath. But this swath is not is not enough to make a viable solution with with a small number of satellites, so we had to make an adaptation. We are making a cross-track pointing system that uses a rotating mirror. This way, we can use the same camera in a not so much complex configuration to scan a much wider, a much wider area. So the mirror can rotate and we can point at different positions while we, while we are still maintaining our satellite in the same orientation. This way we could upgrade the the original swath from 32 kilometers to around 215 kilometers. This way we can have a smaller constellation leading to a smaller final cost. So the constellation we have predicted is a Walker Delta pattern comprising of nine satellites at an altitude of 500 kilometers. The inclination we used is of 20 degrees, which is more than enough to observe the entire Amazon forest. And these nine satellites are in, in, in groups of three in three equally spaced planes. So this is a small GIF of our simulation. We use the general mission analysis tool available by NASA. And we simulated the, all the paths in a one year 
period. So this way we are confident we can achieve a 24 hour revisit time, which we believe is enough for our mission. We wanted to use the STK software for a better for a better simulation, but we unfortunately couldn't have the, the licenses available on time. Now talking about money, we, we estimate a, around 40 million Brazilian reals to launch and operate the first fleet, which includes the, that original 2.5 million for, the, for each satellite and the launch of around 1.3 million Brazilian reals, which is around $250. Since our satellites won't last forever, and estimating a two-year lifespan, we also have another two million Brazilian reels per year, including around four or five launches to maintain our constellation. And we would like to say that these costs are, are inflated so we can avoid um, cost overruns along the way. Since it's an early estimate, we, we prefer to overestimate than underestimate our costs. Now about the implementation to, I'll pass the word to Rafael. Yeah, because of these cost overruns and this inflation that we already established, we have ways to mitigate these, these, uh, these costs and even further downgrade them. So for example, we have, uh, we have to have ground stations and we can use existing infrastructure that it already has in Cuiabaya, Contra, that we can use so we don't have to spend more money on uh, ground stations that have to be developed so we can minimize, minimize the cost even further and for uh, launch capabilities we have uh, because we have a very low mass and for, for a launch and uh, uh, we have to minimize costs. We can minimize the cost. We can absolutely use right share missions to reduce the cost with commercial, already commercially available rockets like the Falcon 9, the Electron, or the Atlas V, or the VLM, because we have such a small, uh, such a small mass for all these satellites. Uh, we can absolutely abuse the right share mission system uh, to launch and even further reduce the cost of the mission. Well, possible risks. Risks are always available because uh, all missions have failures, but we can be we can uh, differentiate be between mitigated risk and no return risks because development delays, hardware failures, and cost overruns can be mitigated through a very good systems engineering and planning. And the concept of operations should take into account redundant systems and planning should take into account possible delays. And these types of risks can be mitigated. So these can further reduce the, the cost of operations. But road return risks are, are, are always there for us. So in orbit collisions are always possible and launch failures are also out of our hand when it comes to possible risks. Uh, that's our references. Uh, we, we use a lot of uh, academia type uh, uh, papers because we wanted to make sure that everything was uh, up to standard and actually real, not just out of our minds. Um, and that's about it. If you, want to, if you have any questions for us, we can we are available now. Uh, thank you very much. That's our presentation. Thank you, Rafael, Pedro, Gustavo. It was a, a really great and complete presentation. Uh, we, we have just one question. Uh, you you show us that the, the pricing for one one of the six U CubeSat will be around 2.5 million Brazilian reais, uh, for commer uh, mainly for the commercial of the shelf uh, uh, components. Uh, and do you think that um, producing, manufacturing, developing, Mainly developing uh, on boards, uh, on boards, uh, printer circuit boards, and 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 systems, subsystems down here in Brazil. Do you think it will be uh, more cost effective, and and how is the impact of this on the uh, the development life cycle? So, uh, do you think it will be is possible to um, develop and manufacture this, and still be able to launch in a a short uh, time of, of uh, short period of time or or the cost is really the, the best alternative here um, yeah, we just, believe just, that yeah just for curiosity yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, sure. Um, we, we consider that and we would be very happy to, to use Brazilian made parts since it, it can make our economy better and our scientific production better. But for now, we, since uh, the focus of our, of our mission isn't the, the parts themselves, or for example, to build a, an onboard computer or to project to design antennas, we prefer the cut solution. But, and we think um, since satellite missions are very complex, we believe that it's a, a single company shouldn't be designing the entire satellite like from scratch. So it's a process that involves many companies, many suppliers, as well as the, the single company that, that is bringing it all together and making a mission. So if we, could, if we find Brazilian part manufacturers, we would be more than happy to to be contracting their services. Perfect. Yes, I agree 100% with you. And uh, for my opinion as well, the COTS components will be the best fit for, for this type of mission. And again, thank you very much. And congratulations to the entire Itarak design team. It was a really complete uh, presentation. And uh, we, really, we, we liked it a lot. Thank you thank very you much for the opportunity.
And we are back now with the team for TOPS Projetos Aeroespaciais. Uh, they will talk about the challenge reusable rockets, revol revolutionizing access to space. Uh, I think this is the first presentation that we will have for this challenge. So uh, we and the, everyone that is watching is very excited and ho hoping to see a great presentation from TOPS. Uh, thank you very much, very much, the TOPS, uh, the entire TOPS team. Uh, for for participating and choosing this challenge, and I, I pass the word for for you, Tops. Please go ahead. Good night, everyone. I am Pedro Fontana, leader of the Curupira mission, and today our team represents our solution of the reusable rockets, revolutionizing access to space challenge. Our mission is to develop a launch vehicle to carry a payload of small sets up to 400 kilograms for the sun synchronous orbit from the Alcantara Launch Center and recover the first stage from a nearby site, and at the same time proposing the logistics and investments to do so. I am Igor Melo, and to begin, I'm going to talk about the concept of operation of the mission. We divide the Canops in four main phases. The first one is the pre-launch logistic in which we are going to prepare the vehicle and payload with all security procedures in the launch base. Next phase, after the liberation signal, the ignition system starts and the rocket lift off. The flights monitor to make corrections, and after 108 seconds, we have the main engine cut off. After the MECO, the first stage is released, and then we go into two steps. Recovering the first stage consists in aligning the object for re-entry, so it can safely open its parachute. Then, a helicopter will recover the stage during the fall and bring it to the base. In parallel, the second stage ignites and takes the payload to orbit. After SECO, the payload is placed in orbit, and second stage begins the sequence to re-enter in the atmosphere. This is our launch vehicle design. All fuselages will be made of carbon fiber, mainly due to their high strength and low structure density. The weight of the entire structure is estimated at approximately 3.9 pounds, with a height about 29 meters. For this separation system, we chose to use our technique fasteners, mainly because of its compatibility and weight. The internal compound will be RDX, a standard part technique Mixture used by NASA. For the payload liberation, we chose to use a low shock pneumatic separation system in order to avoid any damage to, to the payload. To preserve the integrity of the payload, a system was developed to reduce the stress suffered during the flight, reduce the effects of vibration impacts received. Based on the mission's delta V requirements, an estimate of the required propellant mass and structural weight were made and a launch vehicle with a maximum takeoff weight of around 40 tons was designed, consisting of 25 tons of liquid oxygen and 11 tons of kerosene-based RP-1 fuel. The first stage will have 10 pump-fed gas generator cycle engines capable of generating up to 480 kilonewtons of thrust. In the second stage will have one vacuum-optimized engine generating up to 50 kilonewtons of thrust, as well as auxiliary cold gas RCS thrusters for attitude control. The engines are intended to be 3D printed and the tanks are made out of carbon fiber, as it will also integrate the outer fuselage of the vehicle in order to save mass. The choice of propellants, as well as the engine cycle, aims to reduce the development costs of the engine, which are usually a very significant part of the launch costs, by using well-documented, reliable technologies to reduce overall complexity and thus reducing refurbishment costs, since this first stage is intended to be reusable. Moreover, additive manufacturing was chosen as a way to streamline the manufacturing process and reduce the required logistics, achieving a final cost of under $50,000 per engine. Next, regarding the recovery subsystem, after the separation from the second stage, the first one will reach its apogee and then fall back to Earth. During this movement, our ejectors will reorientate the stage in a way that the propulsion bay reaches the atmosphere first, protecting the avionics and recovery components. After this re-entry slows the rocket down to about Mach 1.5, we'll use a nitrocellulose-powered air motor to eject the drogue chute, which has a conical ribbon format appropriate to this full speed. With an area of five meters squared, the chute will slow the stage to about a third of its previous velocity. The 32 meters main parachute has a ring cell shape, which suits the project's objectives and volume disposal, and will be opened about three kilometers above the ocean surface. The chute is tied all together under the drogue, and when the right height is approached, the tie rope will be cut by a proper device. The final appearance will be similar to the right picture. This mechanism and the others mentioned will be activated by an in-stage avionics bay, independent from the others in the rocket. 
As the stage falls with an estimated fall speed of 10 meters per second, the logistic team will recover it with a hook attached to a helicopter. This is important because if the stage actually falls on the water, it may end up corroded or damaged, which would compromise the mission's main concept, reusability. We have chosen the Manaus Free Zone as the base of manufacturing the rocket and its parts. The idea comes in part because of its proximity to Alcantara and because Manaus offers a river road that allows us to deliver our equipment to Alcantara or San Luis by boat. Also, there are tax incentives that will reduce the price of production in materials. The transportation will be conducted, therefore, primarily by river and sea. And because of that, the rock, the pre-assembled, will need to be placed in a special container for protection from the adversities of this road. In blue, uh, Amazon waterway. In red, the sea road to get to yet construction Alcantara port or the San Luis port. In addition, Alcantara has a large airstrip, which allows the transportation by air of seismic equipment like the payloads. After the transit of the rock, the Alcantara that will be final assembled of the rock will be made, which will be done in the horizontal with the integration of the payload and the fixation of the fairing. The fairing. Then the completed rock will be erected and put in the mobile integration tower where the final inspection will be made and will start into the launch. A request to clear the possible drop zone of the booster will need to be made with the respective government agents to mitigate the risks and to facilitate the work of the recovery team. A vessel with the equipment necessary to recover the helicopter will be made placed near the drop zone to accelerate the spawn speed in the recovery team. And after the recovery process, the booster will be sent to Alcantara for simple initial inspection, then will be made transportation to Manaus, where the Amar truck inspection will be made and the booster will press the purpose need to save to reuse. We plan to do the first test flight by the end of 2023 and the first operational flight by the end of 2024. Next, we can move on to the management segments of this project, starting with financials to show you an overview of the materials you chosen and the expenses. First, for the proportion section, we spend around 3 million reais, the equivalent of $500,000. Also, the first two materials were selected due to their efficiency and the engines would be self-made. Second, for the recovery section, we spent around $1,000. The nylon was chosen in spite of its great elasticity and low cost, the fiber for its great attraction and temperature resistance, and the nitrocellulose for its fast burning speed. Third, for avionics section, we spent around $2,000 for our crucial materials. Lastly, for the air structure section, we spent around $5 million. The costs here were high because we need to add the expenses with the employees and the machinery outsourcing. Besides, the fiber was choosing in spite of its great mechanical strength and low density. The explosive screw for its reliability and the aluminum for its corrosion resistance and antimagnetic source. In short, we estimated a total expense of $14 million per launch in this project. Nice slide. To finish, I'm going to introduce our business model. Our value proposition is not only to boost and develop a Latin America space potential, join in an accessible way the global market, but also provide its own autonomy. Having in mind the magnitude of the project, we have decided that our customers' segment will reach since research institutions until state-owned and private companies for all around Latin America. To evaluate our relationship with the clients, our website will count both on the client service attendance and on a future project's prospectation. In addition, we will only not use our social media to share our project's evolution, but also keep in contact frequently, inviting them to join statistics tests and launch. The key activities involved to consolidate these value proposals are to keep the deadline previously set, ensure all employee safety since the manufacturing process until the launch and establish factors around Latin America. The key resources are qualified labor, good transportation logistics, adequate infrastructure to brand installation and business link. To help us, our key partners will be aerospace and government agencies, investors, commodities, manufacturing related and pre-flight companies, and research institutions as well. In sequence, our cost structure, we count on an internal communication system, machinery for possible independent production, payroll, allotment in industrial zones, computational infrastructure, including database and operation centers, compliance with the launch counter aerospace standards, and a functional launch pad. Finally, our revenue streams will come from our own profit over each product, rights, 
both national and international partnership in the marketing and merchandising as well. Slide. I hope you have enjoyed. Thanks for watching. So, hello guys, this is Calvin speaking. Uh, your presentation was amazing. I, I love the, the context, the canvas, uh, the financial analysis, the technical part of the presentation. For example, you guys did a, a, a render, well, a video of the launch. Uh, it was very interesting uh, about the the recovery of the fairings by helicopter. I don't think that it could be cheap and easy, but it is a solution. <laughs> and I, I like the, the idea that you guys uh, thought about it. So I, I personally, I don't have any questions. Uh, I think that you guys uh, did a, a amazing job uh, talking about everything that we, we asked for the for the challenge and uh, you, you you gave us a complete uh, overview of the, the solution. And uh, let me see if he, somebody else of the team has a, a question. Just a second. Any question, guys? No? OK. We, we do not have any uh, question. It's very com the, the, the presentation was very complete. So congratulations, uh, Rafael, Mariana, Davi, Igor. Uh, and uh, Topos Projetos Aerospaciais, Topos Aerospace Projects, congratulations. And uh, we will see you again at 8 o'clock during the award ceremony. Congratulations, guys. See you then, Colin. Thanks. See you.
Hello, everyone. We are back here in 2020 Latin American Space Challenge Conference, online conference for this year. We, we are having today a challenge presentation for each team participating in this year's competition. Uh, for now, the last but not the least, we have the team from Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil, from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, UFRN. The Ultimar Rocket Line Team 18. They will be presenting about a solution, uh, a, about a solution for the responsive launch capability of a small sat challenge. So we have with us uh, today Isa Cavalcante and Renan Aquino. Good evening. Uh, I hope you have uh, a, a great moment to present your solutions here. So good luck and you will have 10 minutes for this presentation. Thanks, Kelvin. Good evening, everyone. We are the Portugal Rocket Design. It is our solution to Challenge 2, Responsive Loud Capability Small Sats, presented by me, Renan Giacchino, and Aissa Cavalcante. First of all, let's talk about our mission, that is provide quality services in launching small satellites. Right next, next our vision that is become a reference for Latin America in the aerospace industry and promote sustainability and our values security and safety, innovation, responsibility, and quality. Okay, about propulsion. Our rocket has two stages and they use the PRD engine, composed of liquid oxygen and kerosene. The first stage model is called PRD Earth, has a thrust equal to 19 kilonewtons in a specific impulse of 250 seconds. For the second stage, the engine is called PRD Leo and has a thrust of 21 kilonewtons and a specific impulse of 274 seconds. An electric pump was chosen to supply the motor. In this way, it simplifies the valve and piping systems, which is hydro two complex, allowing the oxidizer to be injected directly into the combustion chamber. And uh, as a result, project costs are lower and performances is more efficient. In the fuselage of the rocket, we use composite material, such as carbon fiber. The choice of this material is due to excellent mechanical properties, such as high resistance to torsion and a high Young's model. To carry out of this process, we will need the mold that has its ideal external diameter for the coupling of the subsystem. For the construct of the fins, we also use carbon fiber. The use of carbon fiber is linked to its superiority in relation to fiberglass and steel, generating a lighter component with greater resistance to high temperatures and mechanical effort. Therefore, the mechanical and thermal characteristics of the fiber are more advantageous for the aerospace sector. Finally, we will develop the nose cone use lithium and aluminum, which is widely used to make aircraft lighter and more operationally viable. In the rocket hardware one avionics, there will be five RISC five microprocessor architecture that will be in communication with each other to avoid the bit flip error that occurs due to radiation action during the mission. The data will be pressure, temperature, altitude, angular velocity, acceleration, and magnet field. For the transmission of this data, a software defined radio will be used for the location system GPS technology along with satellite based augmentation system. It also have a graphical interface system at the base station for viewing the data transmitting by telemetry. The Emirates system will have an enclosure to guarantee greater security and the components will be tested to guarantee security against the great temperature variation. For example, the Creo Dragon copes with an enormous amount of heat and cold, ranging from 120 degrees Celsius when facing the sun to minus 150 degrees Celsius when sunlight is blocked by the Earth. Now, talking about separation systems, the first stage, the second stage, and the ferry separations are based on a pneumatic unlocking mechanism, which is associated with the springs. Uh, these mechanisms do not require the usage of pyrotechnic elements and therefore uh, provide a safer separation since the detached components are submitted to lower vibration, noise, and temperatures. The parachute-based recovery system are designed for recovering the rocket stage and the ferry. These components will land at sea and therefore be retrieved by ships. The other components burn while deorbiting, avoiding additional space debris. Now about logistics. 
All mechanical components are coming from Brazilian states, São Paulo, Bahia, Amazonas, Pernambuco, and Goiás. Some of them will land in São Luís International Airport, and the others will come by truck. The electronic components come from three countries. The sensors and GPS come from Germany, payload fairing come from Switzerland, and software and antennas come from the United States. They all take about seven days to arrive and will land in San Luis International Airport. Propellant component, com components will come from two countries, Brazil and China. From Brazil, liquid oxygen will come from the company White Martin Gas Industriais. Transport to a country will be by road, and the providers are close to each other in Pará State, and it takes one day to arrive there. From China, kerosene RP1 will come from the company Island Parochemical Industry. Will be transported to the company's branch in Rio de Janeiro by ship, then transported from Rio de Janeiro to a country by, by truck. Route: 90 days to get to Rio de Janeiro and five days to get to our country. Maranhão Express will transport the components to a shed three kilometers away to São Paulo to São Luís Airport. The shed has a thousand and two hundred square meters of area. This large shed makes it possible to store uh, parts for more than one rocket. The transport to Alcantara, Alcantara will be uh, will be by road by the Maranhão Express. The road will go around San Marcos Bay, because crossing by ferry would be very dangerous. The vessel's commander, Sergeant Adson, said in an interview that is a very dangerous crossing and could cause environmental damage that when transported through crews. In short, from the data presented, we can ensure that there will be a responsive quality supply chain. About the canals, assembly. With safety in place, we assemble the rocket as a whole, structure, propellant, payload, as well as reading, meteorological data to assess the situation of the mission. After that, we place it upright and fill the propellers at the right time, and the launch operation it will occur as safely as possible, and, and if the launch is authorized, it will fly according to the image. But in summary, ignition of the first stage, end of the first stage, separation, ignition of second stage, end of second stage, separation, and adjustments to the orbit of the satellites. Now about the cost of our project, we approximated how much would be spent on components and labor. This table specifies in dollars the cost for each sector and the price stipulated for logistics. As well as the total cost, we would have the total value of the project would be close to approximately 12 million and 300,000. In our research, we observed that the price calculated by us was cheaper than other companies in the market. We projected the possible profits for our project with maximum and minimum values ranging from $2.5 million to $2.5 million, with the maximum weight stipulated at one kilogram in the stable. We showed the possible sales values compared to, to the types of satellites and maximum weight. The first line is the cost of our minimum profit, and the last line is the cost with our maximum profit. Well, in our business model, we highlight points that we consider fundamental. In activities, we mention our main services. In costs, we include our main expenses, and we also highlight our transparency with the client. In media, we put our main social networks, which allows us greater accessibility. In sustainability, we show that we are a company with an environment concern. In content, we show the care we have with the customer and the company relationship. In transport, we put our differences, differences obtained by a well-developed logic. And partners and customers, we place our possible customer and partners uh, have, and you can see in that. Uh, that's all, and we would like to thank the opportunity. We are very glad to be here, and I would like to thank us, thanks our team, too. Thank you so much, guys. So let me put my can online, so I'm back here. Thrust, thrust builds thrusts, so I really like it. <laughs> nice, Aissa. Congratulations, Aissa. Congratulations, con congratulations, Renan, for the presentation. Uh, we have some questions from the last team. Uh, the first question is, you guys said about a recovery of the second stage. We know that this was not achieved yet by 
in our company to the, to the world. So SpaceX can recover the fairings, can recover the, the first stage booster, but the second stage is to uh, to, to, to the day a, a challenge for recovery. Uh, just a, a, a curiosity, you guys. Did you, did you think? Did you think about the thermal protection for this kind of uh, recovery? Because of the second stage, uh, the velocity, velocity of the second stage, and the height of the second stage, it could be burned out of the higher layers of the atmosphere. As you said, the thermal protection will be the first important thing about this try to recovery. So. Uh, we would use uh, something that we've planned before, yeah, some kind of systematic we use in parachutes, and the big point it is the, the thermal protection as well. Okay, nice. Uh, nice, nice answer. Uh, I saw, I watched during your presentation about uh, everything that we asked for the the challenge and the for the solutions uh you guys did a, a structured a an organized uh, presentation you guys did a, a and uh, developed a canvas a commercial part a mm -hmm. financial analysis and of, of course the technical part so congratulations it was a, a nice moment to watch your presentation uh we know that this is a some kind of uh, um, a challenge because it, it is in english and you guys had just uh, one week to develop and more or less uh for some of you to 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 get the knowledge about some parts of the the project and uh, i'm very happy about the presentation so congratulations and uh we will see uh you guys again at eight o'clock during the hour's presentation thank you thanks So guys, thank you so much for being present during our day with us during the 2020 Latin American Space Challenge online format. It was a marathon, marathon for us also because uh, we had uh, two days of a uh, more than 12 hours of live live streams. So uh, I would like to to thank you guys from the the teams from from last team also João, Gabriel, Bruno, Maurício, Matheus, Vitor, Isabela, Alexandre, uh, everyone that made it a uh, reality and made it happen. So thank you so much. And uh, for the end of the Latin American Space Challenge for the for this year, we will have the award ceremony and a closed meeting at eight o'clock uh, Brazilian regional time. So thank you so much and see you again at eight o'clock. Thank you, see you.